morning, his Providence family. How's everybody doing? You guys doing good? Doing good. Awesome. So happy you guys are all here. I am Pastor Will, and uh, we're not going to call them the Roots Crew. We're going to call them the Branches. Does that sound good? Our, our, our house band? <laughs> uh, online community, how you guys doing? So glad you are here. So glad you guys all uh, had an awesome Thanksgiving celebration. Who had a great Thanksgiving with their family? Yeah. For whatever college students are still in town, make sure you, you know, wrap up that meal, bring it back to the dorm with you, um, and maybe share it, you know, exchange it with your roommates and everything. Uh, but look around. These decorations, doesn't it just make you feel all Christmassy? Isn't it great? This is so good. So let's clap it up for our Christmas decor team. Thank you so much. Jen McWilliams, thank you for showing up at 6 a.m. and leaving at 7 p.m. She put in extra, extra hours. Uh, tell everybody that was there that uh, you guys get a coffee on me, okay? So, so you guys can get that whenever you want. Um, and for the, the Bags of Hope team that helped to decorate, set up, pies, the 5K. Did anybody run, actually, or walk the 5K? Who showed up and just stood at the line and said, I was here, you know, I finished first. That was, that was you, yeah, that's good. Thank you guys for participating in all of that. You guys are phenomenal. Um, so, one thing that is going on today, my friend and uh, a bunch of us here know them. The Fuentes family is here from Indonesia. They are our missionaries of the month, so clap it up for them. So great. Thank you guys for thank you guys for coming. What I want you guys to do is to go to the table, okay? Go to the table and get this prayer card. But don't just get the prayer card. Make sure you pray for them. All right? Make sure you pray for them as often as the Lord leads you. The first 50 people, you get a piece of Indonesian candy. I know that those are limited, so make sure you go over there. Be among you got one? Is it tasty, Joshi? Is it good? What? Okay, I, I, you're gonna have to ask your dad. You're gonna have to ask your dad. Uh, online community, um, you're gonna have to request the candy to be mailed to you, but you can go to the website and get the information from there and make sure that you're praying for them as well. We wanna support the Fuentes as much as we can with prayer support, financial support, and uh, we'll see if the Lord leads a team to go out to Indonesia. So it is now time. Now time for worship. Who's ready to worship today? You guys are so blessed. First service, amazing worship, amazing word, amazing hearing. This place is prepped, okay? It is prepped, and we're going to enter in right away. Amen? All right? So it is time for service. Pay attention to the announcements. Thank you, Branches crew. I love you guys. You guys are phenomenal. Let's have an awesome service, everybody. I'll see ya. His Providence Church, what a great day to be alive. Hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I hope you laughed a lot. You know, the Bible says a merry heart does good like medicine. So give yourself permission to laugh. Hey, listen, if you're new or visiting, we would love to meet you. Stop by the new here desk in the lobby. <coughs> God rest ye merry gentlemen. No, wrong line, wrong line. <coughs> Jesus is the reason for the season. Don't cut, cut. If you're writing things down, have the best day of your life. Who says that? <laughs> I'm sure you're thankful that my audition wasn't accepted, but some of our kids, in fact, many of our kids, are going to be in a Christmas play in just a couple of weeks, The Christmas Carol, and you can buy tickets today online, hpc.church forward slash Christmas. You can also stop by and visit us in the corridor to purchase your tickets here on site. It is Christmas time officially, and we are very excited. It's wonderful to celebrate the birth of our Savior, and we want you to join us, bring your friends, bring your family, normal services on Christmas Eve, 8.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. We really look forward to seeing you there. Hey, listen, thanks so much. It's going to be a great day. Silence those cell phones, stand to your feet, and let's worship the Lord. All right, good morning, His Providence Church. How we doing? Hallelujah. Y'all still uh, hung over from uh, Thanksgiving? It's all right, we're gonna worship all that off this morning, all right? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Let's go to the Lord. 
Holy Spirit, we just welcome you. We welcome you into this house. This is your house and we are your people and you are our God. And so the greatest thing that we could ask for is that you would be made great in this room, that your bride would, would love you and, and glorify you for who you are, for what you've come to do and for what you uh, still desire to do. So Lord, we say bring every good thing to the day of completion in us. Lord, we are yours in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. There is no shadow that has ever overcome your life. And there is no rival that could ever stand against your mind. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won, we've already won. Can we sing that verse together again? Come on, sing with me. There is. No shadow that has ever overcome your life. There is no rival that could ever stand against you. Ever stand against your life. Who oh, you've always been with us. Every battle you've already won. We've already won.
you serve the God of the impossible. Let's sing this together. Say, he's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. Who can stop the Lord? Jesus. We were talking uh, in the first service about waiting on the Lord and how there was a season in our church going back a few years, a number of years ago, and we were singing that song, Take Courage. And uh, that song says, it's in the waiting, it's in the waiting, it's in the waiting. And there were so many people in our body at the time, and they were just in seasons of torturous waiting. And so we would sing that song, and the altars would just fill up, and people were just weeping. And uh, it was cool. God ministered a lot to it. And, um, but I always sang it from a place of like, we'll sing this for you, you know, so you can like get it. And uh, <laughs> I wasn't the one waiting. Now I hate that song um, because I'm the one uh, in the waiting. 
And uh, our church is in a season of waiting again. And the Lord is in his goodness and his mercy. He'll, he brings us back around to these places because it's good for us. Amen. Somebody just needs to remind yourself. It's good for me to be waiting. It's good for me between, to, to be between a rock and a hard place so long as the rock is Jesus Christ. Amen. And so I want to encourage you, if you're in here this morning and you are, um, you are turning over a wilderness season of your life to the Lord, you're waiting. You're waiting. And you need to get real with the Lord and say, because here's the deal. A lot of times we wait and we wait and we wait until it hurts. And then it seems like the hurt is the breakthrough. And as we were saying this morning, the, the crazy thing is the hurt is actually what the Lord is trying to get to. Because we won't really allow him to bring transformation into our lives until it hurts. And so if waiting for you means just trying to be patient or just trying to uh, pinch off enough self-discipline or self-control or long-suffering in your flesh, well, that's not what the Lord's after. He, he wants to bring us to the end of ourselves, saints. And so if you're in here and, and you're waiting on the Lord, I want to invite you to step out of your seat, skip the next like seven chapters and just, just get desperate before God. Don't wait until you're out of options. Don't wait until it's your last resort. Don't wait until you've tried everything else your way and now you're gonna finally get desperate for the Lord. Just get right to it this morning and say, God, we're desperate for you. We need you. I need you. I need you to do in me what you've been longing to do. I need whatever flesh that needs to be put to death and this, this lap around the wilderness just to go in Jesus' name. If that's you and you want to spend some time at this altar, uh, we just want to open it up. Come down, get on your knees, come here and stand with us. Let's just, let's just get real before the Lord of how we're not going to do this without Him. Now Jamal's not here, so you're going to have to sing this with me. And I don't believe in fairy tales. Yes, I've outgrown them, but that doesn't mean I don't believe that there's something bigger than me, cause I've seen it in a hospital room when doctors said sorry, cause there's nothing more we can do, well it wasn't through, I've never seen a pot of gold at the end of a rain. I've got a promise I can hold in the middle of the struggle. God, if you said it, you perform it. May not be how I want you to. But here's what I'll do. Come on, tell him, say. I'm going to wait on you. I'm going to wait on you. I've tasted your goodness. I'll trust in your promise. Say, I know you've ordered every step. I know you've ordered every step. And you are the author. But there's no predicting what is next. But you hold the future. And all the questions, they come second to the one I know.
their strength They shall mount up upon wings Like an eagle and soar They will walk and not get weary They shall run and not fade That's what happens when you wait My soul doth wait. I wait on the Lord more than they that wait upon the morning. I say, more than they that wait upon the morning. When the Lord is the light of your new day, you're not waiting for the sun to rise. You're waiting for the Lord to manifest his presence in your life. Jesus, Jesus. Lord, I pray that our eyes would get off the horizon and the sense of 
waiting for this night time to be over, this season of frustration, this season of fear, this season of struggle. Lord, that our eyes would come off the horizon as we beg for light in the darkness and that we would turn our eyes toward you. As the psalmist wrote, even darkness is as light before you. And so, Lord, be the sun in our horizon. As it is in heaven where there, your word's so clear, there's no sun. Ezekiel sees it in his vision that, that you are the light in the new kingdom. Lord, let that kingdom come in our lives. That you would be the light. That you would be the new day. And blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. Yeah. Say, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. Trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Fix a mission and all is at. And this is my song. Somebody worship him. Say, I'm praising my risen King and Savior all the day long. I trust in God, my Savior, who will never
Worshiping this morning, I just I kind of got a word for someone here. Um, last night you were sitting at home and you and your spouse uh, were looking at the bills, thinking about Christmas coming up, and I just you had a, a really difficult conversation about where you're at financially, um, to the point where even you were like, you know, uh, maybe we should open some credit cards to to purchase this or to buy this or to pay for this. Um, and I just believe you're in this room this morning. And I just want you to know the Lord, um, he will provide for you. I'm not going to call you out and have you raise your hand, but just receive this. I've got a word for you uh, that the hard thing is the right thing. The hard thing is the right thing. And the Lord is going to honor you and bless you if you honor him and bless him with your finances. And as again, as we've been worshiping, I just... Feel the Lord calling us as a church right now, this morning, into this place with him. Into this place under the shadow of his wing. Psalm 91 4 says his, his pinions, his wings, his feathers cover you and it's a safe place. And I just hear the heart of Jesus as he's, as he's speaking to his people saying, I... You guys, you just, you kill prophets and you chase them out. But, oh, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you under my wings like a hen gathers her chicks. If you would just submit and surrender yourself to his covering, that he would spread his tabernacle over you, his feathers, his wings would come over you. And in that place, there is fullness of joy. There is freedom. There is healing. His presence is there. It is a place of refuge for you and so as a church not just that family with struggling with the finances but us right now if we would just surrender and submit and say lord right now father we just surrender ourselves to you uh, we need your wings to come over us we need you lord we want you to spread that tabernacle over us your wings over us lord God, we willingly come in under your covering into the shadow, into the secret place, God. So do it here this morning, Lord. And if that's you struggling with the finances and you want someone to pray for you, I'm just down here in the front, come find me. I will pray and believe that God is gonna, he's gonna provide for you. But the, the hard, whatever this decision is, the hard thing is the right thing. In Jesus' name.
sing that line again. I'll bring you more than a song. I'll bring you more than a song. Oh, come on, sing it again. Make it about more than just the words on the screen. Hey. I'll bring you more than a song. This is the Somebody get desperate for it.
have a seat this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. For I know you satisfy. I am empty, but I know your love does not run dry. And so I
Come on, sing that verse with me one more time. Say broken. Jesus, your all this heart is living for God. Yes, God. Thank you, Lord. Good morning, guys. Praise God. So many things are happening this morning. Thank you, Lord. Hey, guys. My name's Roger. Um, I'm a part of the missions team here. And, uh, I get the privilege of introducing the Fuentes family this morning. Um, they're missionaries in one of my favorite places on the planet, and it's a land of volcanoes and Komodo dragons and all kinds of amazing things. And um, before they come up, they're going to share a short film, short video, but uh, we're honored to have you guys this morning. Um, we get to support these guys because of the money that comes in and 15% of everything that comes into this house goes straight to missions and outreach. And sometimes that's here in New Bedford or Fall River or Swansea. And sometimes that's in places like Indonesia and all over the world. So we love you guys. We're happy to have you. Check out the video. Hi, this is Jason and NG Fuentes. We and our four children have been living and serving in Indonesia for the past nine years, and God is doing amazing things. Indonesia is located in Southeast Asia. It is the fourth largest nation in the world and the largest Muslim nation in the world, of which half of that have never been reached with the gospel. And one of the ways we are reaching the unreached population of Indonesia is by going to these remote areas. One time, there was a lady who asked us to come and pray for her daughter. This adult daughter was so demonized. When we and the team went there, we were able to set her free in Jesus' mighty name. And because she was set free, her family and her neighborhood decided to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And that was the start of one of our many house churches. Also, our English class ministry has continued. We go into local communities where we're welcomed as well as into schools. It's a great opportunity to share Bible stories. We sing with the children, we play games, and just share with them the love of Jesus as much as we can. And speaking about English, we have recognized it's a tool here to reach many of the local population, so much so God put in our hearts that we are going to plant an English-speaking church where we want to be able to create a hub to reach many with the gospel of Christ. Please pray for us as a family and as a church, we embark on this new adventure in this upcoming year. And speaking about new adventures, God put on our heart to do these open air, outdoor evangelistic crusades where we're able to preach the gospel and show the demonstration of Jesus' resurrection power 
where people hear, they receive him as his Lord and Savior. Many are healed and touched because of the power of God. Pray for us because we can continue to do this type of outreach, not just on one island, but through many islands throughout Indonesia. We want to say thank you so much for standing with our family, partnering with us, because by your prayers and giving, you make an impact right here in Indonesia as well as where you are in America. Thank you and God bless. All right, good morning, good morning. It's good to be with the church family this morning. Uh, there are some familiar faces that we do recognize. And some of you are thinking, I think I know them. But I want to take time for NG to introduce the family. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what God is doing across the oceans in a country like Indonesia. Yes. Selamat siang. It's not morning now, so I can say it's like lunchtime. <laughs> and that's what selamat siang means. So, yeah, this is our family. We are kind of local to Rhode Island. Jason and I went to North Point. That's where we graduated from. All of our kids were born here. But we have been in Indonesia about 10 years. And this is what we call our furlough year, meaning that we come back and share with churches that do support us what we've been up to. And then we also are trying to get new support. So our kids are Samuel, Julia, Eliana is our oldest, and then Alexia. We are just thrilled to be with you guys every now and then. We come visit on Sundays, actually to the first service, and what I'm seeing is that there are more empty spots in the second, so maybe I should be coming to the second, because in the first, it, even if I'm here at 8.30, there's nowhere to sit. So you guys are blessed to have a growing, thriving church. It's amazing. We're so happy for you. And basically, we're going to show a little slideshow. The kids are going to make their way back down. Thank you, you and guys. Amen. If it's okay, uh, your, to your senior pastors, Zach and Ashley, we went to Bible school with them. But I want to share something for this church that I don't share with, I think, any church, really. You know, it seems like today in churches we have a lot of places where they just have an atmosphere. And coming here, we definitely feel, we know that the spirit, of the atmosphere, the spirit of the Lord is here. That's why I'm able to sit right over there weeping before the Lord because he's good. But the Lord reminded me of this scripture in Isaiah 11. And it reads as such. I'm getting emotional now. And this is a messianic prophecy that I believe that this is what God has been doing here and will continue to do here. It's a prophecy talking about the Messiah who is Jesus but I believe that this church is definitely hosting uh, the spirit of the living Lord. And chapter 11 of Isaiah, verse 2, it says, And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. He will delight in obeying the Lord. And I feel like in this church, you have exactly what that prophecy talks about. There's a place of wisdom, of might, meaning the power of God. You know, you see signs and healings. There's knowledge. There's going to be, and especially, I would say, the most important to the Lord is having a healthy fear of him. And I want to say thank you so much for being a part of a church that wants to make a difference right across the street. Not here in Swansea or Fall River or whatever you are, but also in countries like Indonesia. I want to say thank you for that. Yes. Thank you to you guys for praying for us, to the prayer team. Uh, we really need your prayers. We covet them. We're thankful. When I come here, I come not just for a great worship experience, but because when I come, God usually speaks right to my heart through what your pastor is speaking, preaching on. So I really appreciate the gift to preach that is on you, Pastor Zach. Uh, please avail yourself on your way back down that way. Um, you'll find our table where we have our prayer cards. You're welcome to one and also our Indonesian coffee candy. And we just happen to have an Indonesian friend with us who is a college student at North Point. She's an international student. That's Livia. We're so grateful for her. She used to babysit our kids when they were little. Hey, hey Livia, can you stand up and wave so everyone can see you? Yeah, there she goes. She's a blessing. 
Amen, yeah. Does anybody know anybody Indonesian here? Ever had any Indonesian cuisine? So broaden your horizons, have a chat with her, go to Boston or New York, I don't know, where you'd find an Indonesian restaurant. So guys, our slides, uh, just to point out to you, Indonesia is located just above Australia on the other side of the globe. Um, it's a beautiful place. You can go on to the next slide. And in this slide, we wanna point to you that in the middle box, it says total population unreached. 196 million people are unreached. Out of that 196, 140 people had never been engaged with the gospel. What does that mean? They never heard the gospel message. Maybe they heard the name of Jesus or Isa, which is the name of Jesus in the Quran and the Muslim faith, but they never heard, and this is why God has such a great plan for a country like Indonesia, and we're just a part of it. Next slide. And so we love how God put in our hearts that we, we have started churches, we lead churches, we do outreaches, and we want to share a little, bit of, a little bit more about that with you. Next slide. That, by the way, that picture was a baptism service, so just in case you're wondering, like, what was that baptism? Um, I wanted to share this because it's so important that we share with you what we teach and lead our people. And there's so many things on this list, our practices and our core values. But what I want to share with you is the core values number five, where it says suffering for Christ. I don't know if you realize but a lot of times when people decide to receive Jesus, they do suffer for Christ overseas. I remember this one time, there was this one young man that Engie and I were able to lead to the Lord. He came from a very strict Muslim background. And it was a radical thing because he said this, what is this? I never felt this before, talking about having an atmosphere God wants us to carry his anointing that helps to break things off of people and see him for who he is. And then number two, he said, I never heard this before. And we begin to share the gospel more and more about how Jesus is the lamb, how we need him to have full forgiveness from God. He believed that night. And he said, I'm going to receive Jesus. We went through the process, said, young man, I'll meet you in two more days so we can go through this and go through discipleship. It's a good thing he didn't tell me anything, because if he would have told me what he was about to do, I would have stopped him. Thank the Lord I was not able. Because that night, he goes home, he tells his very Muslim family, I became a Christian, I'm going to follow Jesus only, and I'm rejecting the religion of our family. That night, his family literally beat him. So he was bruised and bloody kicked him out and said, you are no longer our son. You are dead to us. You must leave. So two days later, I'm meeting with him at a local cafe in the island of Java. And as I'm walking in, I'm seeing him weeping and crying. And I knew, uh-oh, this is not going to be easy. But as I begin to share with him, he details the story of what happened and, and how he's been living on the street since. And now he's meeting with me, hoping I can bring comfort and hoping I can give him what he needed. And as we're sharing and talking, in that like hour conversation, we came to the point I said, what do you want to do? He's like, I'm hurt. I lost my family. I lost my community. He lost his finances because they were paying his bills for the university. Like, he, he, you know what I'm saying? He lost everything at a young age of 21 years old. He was like, but I want to tell you, Jesus is real. And I'm going to follow him. And that's the price that sometimes people have to pay overseas. Next slide is one where we just want to highlight worship. So we had a wonderful crusade, uh, and that's one picture that you see there. But the other one is more of what's normal for us is to go into the village and go into people's homes. You can see Rebecca is the only Caucasian girl in the back with the guitar, and she was our intern for a whole year. And um, 
Amazingly, it was during COVID, so she was stuck in a hotel during that whole, like, what, 10 days isolation, all that. It was crazy. But she was so brave. And basically, guys, we need help, and we can use your gifts. The Lord has given you teaching, worshiping, We just want you to serve. Just come serve. Yeah. And it's a process. Don't worry about your gifts. Just come serve. <laughs> and it's a process, so you'd have to raise your funds for it. But, you know, God will honor that, and God will provide. So if you want to talk to us about that, we'd love to get to know you and kind of point you in the right direction. Next slide. So our baptism service is something that Jason mentioned. This particular picture, you'll see that our two youngest got baptized. But over in the water, you'll also see a lady who uh, had left her Indonesian Hindu uh, beliefs and uh, decided to be baptized with us. She brought many friends, uh, including her previous priest, Hindu priest, and it was really neat because he wanted to see what we were doing, and uh, he also kind of wanted to hand her off to us and even gave us a charge to take good care of her. So it was just a great experience um, to do that kind of as a community. Next. Uh, and so our kids' ministry consists of teaching them kind of character values, but we can use the Bible to do that. And uh, we sing songs that I can teach them the lyrics, what they actually mean. So that's exciting too, because the gospel is in those songs, Jesus loves me, this I know. Um, and the other lady uh, is just us giving away staple foods, especially during COVID. We could get into some communities that usually wouldn't welcome us in, but that was a blessing in disguise. And what we love is just having the heart of evangelism. And I love about this church is that you have the five-fold ministry offices operating out of here. And that's what God desires for each and every church. So we do medical clinics where we go into these areas that are closed, but we have a church nearby. And it's great to have Christian doctors. And it just opens up for people to hear the message. Every person comes through for a free medical checkup, right? They have someone with them, talking to them, engaging them. And all these people are doing are just sharing the testimonies. It's that simple. And we do things like outdoor crusades. We're in the prisons. What we want to say is this. We are in the places that God has opened a door for us. Not every open door we walk through, but the one that God says, this is where we want you. And we're so grateful for those opportunities to see a nation at least get to hear and encounter Jesus for what he did for all mankind 2,000 years ago. Next slide. And this is just more pictures of a crusade in Manado and baptisms and kids. And, you know, there's always a pool of stories that we have. And you're thinking, God, what should I share? And I was thinking about this story just earlier while we were worshiping. It came to my mind. And there was a story when I was in the northern part of a remote island. And there were the new Christians who came to faith from a, from a Hindu background. And as I'm teaching the word and just sharing, these families were being persecuted because in their belief uh, or in their former religion, they have all these idols that they must keep. And this family decided to destroy it just like King Josiah in Jesus' name. Come on. Got rid of these idols to say, nope. We no longer the false gods of Hinduism, but we follow the God of all creation. And I remember as I'm teaching, there was this one man, a little bit older, maybe in his upper 50s, you know, not so much nutrition because he had missing teeth and all this stuff. And as I'm teaching the things of God, he's crying and weeping, and he's saying this in the, the Balinese language, which I don't speak Balinese, I speak Indonesian. And he's saying, tell me more. Tell me more. I cannot read. Tell me more. And this is why God is calling men and women and children to say, who is ready to surrender it all for his namesake? Because they might be neighbors across your street who need to hear this and want to know more. But also there are people who never heard the message of Christ that need to hear more. And the biggest trick that the enemy has pulled over our eyes is thinking that we need more stuff 
to feel fulfilled. And that's the trick that he pulled early on in the garden of Adam and Eve. Where it's like, what you don't have is what you really need. And Adam and Eve had the presence of God. They had everything they needed, but they believed that lie. And there are nations today, including America, who think, if I just have more stuff, it's going to fill the void and the need that only God can fill. And we get caught up in this lie like, if I can get one dollar, then two must be better. If I can have one car then two cars must be, if I can take one vacation, then two vacations must be better. And that's not what satisfied. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And he's the one that's satisfying people in the middle of a village that have no Judeo-Christian background saying, he is enough. Tell me more. And I know that Pastor Zach was being so transparent in his message. You're going to hear that. And I'm not trying to steal anything, take anything away. But I'm reminded of the words of a famous, well-quoted missionary. In all the missionary classes, you go to any Bible institute, Bible college, about William Carey, who served his life in India. And he said these words. And these words still haunt me today. I'm not afraid of failing. But I'm afraid of being successful. What doesn't matter? And in the light of eternity, what really matters is Jesus. Last slide. I've got to do this. And going to have the people come up to pray for us. I think Pastor Zach, whoever else. We just want to say thank you, His Providence Church, because you guys have been supporting us for quite some time. And every time you give, every time you pray, you are making an impact and you're storing treasures in heaven. And I want to say thank you. Thank you. Don't forget, please visit our table right out there. We got a coffee can. It's really, really, really good, right? It's made from the soil, volcano ash, and all this other great stuff to get you there, right? Amen. And it's actually made in Indonesia. And this is our prayer card. We need and cover your prayers. Amen. Yeah, love it. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. Can we just extend our hands to these guys and this family? God, we're so grateful, God. We're so grateful. We just pray a, a, an, an intense, mighty blessing over, over these guys and their family, over their ministry, over their communities, God, over all the, the churches that are, are springing up over, that nation, over the nation of uh, Indonesia, God, 17,000 islands. And we pray that every single one of them comes to know the fullness of God's love and freedom and acceptance over them, Lord. Um, we pray for uh, just health and wholeness in their bodies. We pray for abundant provision. And we're just so grateful, God. We give you all the glory that we can partner with what you're doing. And um, thank you so much, Lord. Amen. Hey, love you guys. Thank you. Yes. So good. We did go to Bible school together. And I think, I think we had like theology three or four. Um, together, and I remember sitting next to NG in class. I remember Jason being on staff um, in Providence for a while, and we kind of had partnered together on some things then. And I just want to remind this church: we, as as a fellowship, when Roger's talking about fifteen percent and and that going to missions, um, we don't support ministries; we support people uh, who do ministry. And it always comes back to the person, and it always comes back to a relationship that we have with the person and the person's heart, the, the marriage's heart, the family's heart. And so I just want to thank you guys um, for being so trustworthy with the call and such good stewards of your anointing and um, the, the mandate of this assignment on your life. I think it's incredible. And uh, we as a church, we love you, we support you, and we've got you covered. So, yeah, it's huge. And... I, I think that goes across the board. It's kind of a good window for us just to say in general, um, we've, always, we've always watched for people's heart. Um, we don't need to see, uh, you know, how many prayer cards are filled out or how many churches got planted or this. That's all awesome, and we love seeing that. But at the end of the day, if you didn't have one miracle story to tell or you didn't have one church planted, um, this is about your heart and the call of God on your life. So thank you for that. Amen. Uh, another thing about Mission Sundays that I love is 
as, as they were sharing in first service, I was sitting there thinking about Paul's letters to the early church. And, you know, it, it wasn't easy and it wasn't inexpensive for people to travel and around the known world at the time. And so as these letters would go out, or as Paul, an apostle, would travel from place to place, it was important to him and it was important to the Lord that word be brought from one church to another, from, from Ephesus to Thessalonica and from Thessalonica to Rome. And, and around this, this apostolic unfolding of the early church, Paul wanted to make sure that one church was encouraged by the fact that, hey, on the other side of the world, number one, they're going through persecution, maybe worse than yours, definitely in our case. And number two, God's moving mightily there. And so on both accounts, know this, they require our prayers, they require our support, but they also require just the awareness of the fact that we're in this thing together. Amen? Yes. Yeah. Wake up. Turn with me to Mark 10. This is the late service. Y'all don't even have an excuse for a Thanksgiving hangover. Mark 10, there's a story, and, uh, and I love this story. We're going to be in it for a few minutes here before we go. But I, I want to encourage you to find yourself in it. Don't just let this be another New Testament, you know, oh, it's the parable, or oh, it's a Jesus teaching, or oh, it's red letters. Don't, don't um, just let this be a 2,000-year-old story. Find yourself in it. Um, and, and get real with, with the part you play wherever that falls in this. This was something that I brought to our staff uh, a, a week ago or so, and the Lord just hasn't let me go with it. Usually we do a staff devotion or we do something along the way, and then I can kind of park it and move on to the next thing. And this was one that the Lord has said, no, we're going to stay here a while. So we're here this morning too. This is the story of blind Bartimaeus. Chapter 10, verse 46 says, then they came to Jericho. Who is they? It was Jesus and his disciples. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and now also a large crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. Now, this was not uncommon. A lame or crippled or blind person would sit at the side of the road and they would survive off the money and charity of others. It's not unlike folks today sort of panhandling at stoplights because at the gate, traffic would sort of bottleneck, whether you're going in or coming out. And like at a red light, say, pulling up to the Wampanoag Trail, you know, just saying, if that was ever a place where anybody ever encountered somebody like this, uh, you know, pulling out of the Home Depot, you know, with the Chipotle on your left and Applebee's on your right. And you pull up to the red light and there's a choke and everything stops. Everybody waits and everybody's turning and stopping at the light. And there was a place provided there for people. The cops aren't shooing them away. It's, it's like, a, hey, okay, you can stand here and you can sort of shake a cup or hold a sign or, you know, ask for money or, you know, trying to get people to feel sorry for you or whatever it is. And the same exact thing was true 2,000 years ago. But just as it was then, so it is today that perhaps the worst part about this condition of being blind or being disabled or being crippled or being handicapped or being mentally ill Perhaps the worst part about this condition is that society had and still has an acceptable place for it. Now, some of you guys are getting ready to throw tomatoes at me because you think I'm going somewhere and I'm not going there. But listen, I think one of the worst things that we can do is cater to a brokenness in such a way that it propagates the brokenness. I think one of the worst things that we can do as a church, and especially as a body of Christ filled by his spirit, is to create a safe place for brokenness to thrive. And you may not call it thriving, but the mindset of brokenness is, if I can just get enough for my next bottle of booze, or if I can just get enough to, to buy myself a fast food meal. Or if I can just get enough to, to get a hotel room tonight because it's dropping below freezing. And these are all things that play on the heartstrings of us. And so we so into it. We love these places, even if they're inconvenient, even if they're uncomfortable. As a culture, 
we create an acceptable place for it. Why? Because for as long as there was something visibly broken in somebody else, it helps us ignore the harder to see brokenness in ourselves. For as long as... For as long as there was something visibly broken in somebody else, it's easier to ignore the harder to see brokenness in ourselves. We, there's a part of us that appreciates it. Why? Because it helps us appreciate what we have. It helps us to point to, to somebody and say to our kids, we should be grateful for what we have. At Christmas time, you know, there's people that need the charity and live off the, off the mercy of others we should be so grateful. You may not like what's for dinner tonight, but at least you're not going hungry. Did anybody ever say that? Like there are kids in Africa that are starving and you're trying to lead your kid on a guilt trip and my kid's like name three. I'm like, calling your bluff. That's what they do these days. So for as long as there's something visibly broken, well, at least theirs is worse than mine. At least that situation. At least, at least, you know, we have a house to go back to, even if it's not our dream house. But saints, if you can leave here with one thing today, make sure you get this. Just because our culture provides a safe place for our brokenness doesn't mean we should stay broken. Just because the world, just because you're a therapist, just because, just because your addiction counselor or whatever it is, just because there's somebody somewhere that's helping you feel safe in your brokenness doesn't mean that you should stay broken. Now, we talk a lot about brokenness here, and sometimes we talk about it in a good light, like bring your brokenness before the Lord, brokenness before Jesus. You know, we talk about Mary's broken alabaster jar and that there's a breaking that happens in us when we really get real with God. And there's a difference between being broken as an act of worship and being broken because of generational stuff that comes down the pipe and lands on you. There's a big difference between brokenness because the Lord breaks your heart and gives you a burden for Indonesia and brokenness because, you know, you've just decided to sit in your, in your mental illness and wallow in it because the world high fives you for it and sends you a disability check. There's a big difference. We see Jesus, and he acts mercifully towards these folks. And so we have no excuse but to do that ourselves. The question is, as believers, are we or are we not called up higher than to wallow in that place? When he heard it was Jesus, when he heard it was Jesus, we're going to keep reading in verse 47. When he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene walking by, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many were sternly telling him to be quiet. Shh, quiet. How many of you hate to be told to be quiet? Anybody, is that like your pet peeve? Justine, you must get that a lot too. I love you. I get it a lot. Jesus, son of David, have mercy. And many were telling him, shh, be quiet. Know your place. But he kept crying out all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me, the Bible says. And in verse 49, Jesus stops and says to him, call him here. So they called the blind man, saying to him, take courage and stand up. He's calling you. So throwing aside his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus and answering him, Jesus said, okay, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and began following him on the road. This is a cool story, but there's a couple of things we got to get before we leave. Pay special attention to how he addresses the Lord. Jesus, son of David. Jesus, son of David. Now, to us, again, way down the road, we're used to seeing these different names for Jesus. They call him teacher. They call him rabbi. They call him, that's not my name. That's not my name. They call me, anyway. 
I have to be careful now in this service because they film it and then they use it against me. And, and, it, and this keeps happening because Dave LeBeau is on staff and he blackmails me. Every time I like try to dance or anything, just a simple worship dance to the Lord or anything like that, you know, it comes down on me in staff meeting. They contact legal, it's, it gets ugly. Here's the deal. When Bartimaeus says, Jesus, son of David, it's not just because it's another cliche catchphrase table name, you know, that everybody knows. He's making a connection between the man walking past him and the prophecy fulfilled by God. Jesus, son of David, what he's acknowledging here is, hey, we had a king, his name was David, and with David, our father made a covenant. And with that covenant, there would always be a man on his throne, a Messiah, one who would come and whose sacrifice would cover us all, one who would fulfill this law we've been trying to keep and make it all worthwhile. And it's him, and he's headed this way. Now, when I call out to him, it doesn't sound like everybody else just swearing and, and profanely screaming out the name of God, void of its power, neutralizing, diluting the real significance of what this name really means. It's not some stupid Christmas cliche. Oh, isn't it ironic? Isn't it ironic that at, at the time of year when suicide and depression and addiction are at their absolute worst, that we will allow culture to dilute the name and purpose of Jesus down to nothing more than some marketing commercialized scam. Yes, his name has become a cliche. And part of it is the church is doing. And the world's just followed suit like they always do. Oh, we can use it and like, you know, sell something and it'll be fine. And so now we use it and end up selling ourselves, and it'll all be fine. And at the end of the day, what we end with is a bride of Jesus that can't say his name and still connect it to the prophetic promise of our Father. Jesus, Son of David! Son of David! We need to be able to do this, saints. And I want to challenge you, this time of year especially, whatever you need to do to reconnect Build another bridge between that baby that was born in a manger and the fact that you're going to heaven. The fact that your sins are covered. The fact that precious, pure, innocent blood was shed for us. Son of David connected Jesus to the fact that he was God's prophetic fulfillment of promise. We need to make that same connection. We need to make that same connection. And so finally, he calls out. Jesus hears him. says, call him here. So they call him. And he, and he asks this really bizarre question. And Jesus was full of these questions that just are like, come on, Lord, you're better than that. You don't need to ask that. You know what this guy needs. But Jesus was doing this on purpose. And I want to dig into this for just a minute here. See, something really important happened between old Bart crying out and the time that he was confronted by the Lord, something very important happens. And it's this. The crowd tells him to shush. The crowd tells him to shush. Now, you know my theory on crowds. I ran it by the Fuentes group this morning, and it comes back clean. Um, the crowd is always wrong, okay? The crowd in Indonesia, the crowd in New England, the crowd in outside Jericho that day, the crowd is always wrong. The crowd wants everybody to stay in their place. The crowd wants the blind man by the side of the road to stay the blind man by the side of the road. We want him to beg because it reminds us that we are better off than him, but we want, don't want him to beg too loud because it makes us uncomfortable and it gets in the way of what we're trying to do. We want him to beg but we want him to also remember that we're meeting your need. Remember, you got a free cell phone. You have a free public transportation card. You should be all set. Quiet down now. Know your place. We're missing it. When we become the crowd, we're missing it. 
Sometimes, sometimes we become the crowd to people who we love and genuinely want the best for. But we become the crowd with very, very good intentions, just reminding them that they should just be quiet. You should just be thankful for what you have. You should just be thankful for the crust of bread and the, the couple of coins in the bottom of your cup. So something important happens here. And when Jesus, when he finally gets to Jesus, Jesus asks him, what do you want me to do for you? Why was that question so important? Why did it matter that Bartimaeus answered that question? Here's why. Because in that moment between crying out and being heard, and many of you are in this moment right now in your lives. It's the moment. It's the waiting. It's the season between crying out, Jesus, son of David, and him saying, okay, come here. In that moment, many of us are hearing the same lies. We're feeling the same oppression. The world, the enemy, everything out there wants to keep you in your place. Nobody's afraid of another poverty mindsetted Christian. Nobody's afraid of another Christian that's just bound up in chains and bondage. Nobody's afraid of a Christian who, who is afraid to really connect Jesus to their prophetic promises. And so instead they just call out the cliches like, Jesus is the reason for the season. <laughs> what does that even mean to you? What does that mean to you? It just means you have to go to church twice in the month of December instead of once. Man, first service, love this message. <laughs> Second service, ugh, get to the point, Zach, land the plane here. All right, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I promise you. In that moment, the crowd becomes a deafening roar. Sometimes the crowd is one person. Sometimes it's a whisper. Sometimes it's a text message. Sometimes it's a Facebook post or an Instagram line. And whatever it is, it's just enough so that by the time you get to Jesus, you're just another guy with a cup and change in it, rattling it. And when Jesus asks, what do you want me to do for you? It's because Bartimaeus had options. You know what his options were? I could ask this guy for a crust of bread. I could ask this guy for some more pocket change. Hey, because it's Jesus, maybe he'll give me a whole sandwich. Because it's Jesus, maybe he'll, 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 you know, put me up in a, in a hotel for a couple of nights. Maybe I'll get more from him in the same vein of what my, my disability tells me I need. And many of us, that's how we approach the Lord. We keep coming back to him, hoping that he'll cater to the very thing that he really wants to heal. Jesus asks this weird question because he's picking up on an internal battle in Bartimaeus, a battle inside all of us, a battle between what the world tells us we need and what Jesus really wants us to have faith to ask for. See, that's what this comes down to. Not who you believe in, it's what you believe for. If I took a poll in here, most of you, you believe in Jesus. You believe in Jesus. Even if you're not 100% sure how much, you're like, there's still stuff I'm trying to figure out. I'm like, I don't know. I get it. The tan guy is good looking. The short, pale guy, I don't know. It doesn't. If we could hear more of him, stories about miracles, you know, if we could, and this pretty family, it's like, all that makes sense. This guy should stay on the keyboard. I see you. I see you. The Lord sees you, okay? I see that hand. Here's what's important, okay? What is important? It's written down here somewhere. Here's what's important. Knowing who you believe in is absolutely foundational. It's what gives us the name to cry out to to begin with. It's that thing in us, that spirit in us that says, cry out to Jesus. 
cry out to Jesus. Go ahead, build the bridge. Connect him to the fact that he's your savior. Connect him to the fact that he's king of kings and lord of lords and he'll reign forever, that he came as a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Go ahead, build the bridge. Go ahead, start to declare the promises over your life. So long as when it comes time to really believe him for something, you backpedal. What do you want me to do for you? What are you really believing me for? Thank you for believing in me. Thank you. You're welcome for dying on the cross. You're welcome for being your savior. But what are you really believing for? It's a terrible question because it forces us to confront the doubt it forces us to confront the lies that we've taken ownership of. It forces us to confront the identity that we've allowed the world to place on us. And to say, am I staying here and just asking Jesus to help me here? Or am I going to let him do what he's been wanting to do? Would you stand with me? One of my favorite parts of this whole story it happens right here. When the crowd turns to him and they say, hey, hey, apparently he wants you. We don't know why either, but okay, go ahead, stand up. And so the real Bartimaeus stands up. And at that moment, he throws his cloak to the side and he takes off running. Now, has anybody seen a blind man run? No, you haven't. If you had, it would probably be on a meme already. You've never seen a blind man run because it would be a wreck. It would be a disaster. He'd be running into things. He'd be bouncing off people. He'd be getting helped up, picked up by others. He's still blind, by the way, when he makes it to Jesus. Okay? But he doesn't care. He doesn't care. He gets to Jesus ready to make the decision that Jesus is asking him to make. And I feel like that preparedness, that readiness is something that oftentimes we're missing. Because again, the worst part about the brokenness that we're in is that the world makes us feel good in it. The world makes us feel all right, like it's gonna be okay. We're, we're just gonna keep cashing the check and we're gonna keep living off of whatever and we're, we're never gonna aspire to be anywhere else beyond that. We're never gonna walk in the fullness of our calling. We're just happy to kind of limp along at all. But he says, what do you want me to do? And Bartimaeus says, Lord, I think there was a healthy dramatic pause there. Mark Mark, the gospel of Mark has the word immediately and suddenly more than all the rest of the Bible put together. I made that up. <laughs> but definitely more than all the other gospels. There's an urgency in the book of Mark. It's like, he's, it's like he's a little ADD and he's writing and he's like, and then this happened, then this happened, then this happened, suddenly, suddenly, immediately. Read it, you'll get it, you, you'll see it, it's in there. But I, I sense a pause here. And my prayer is that there would be a pause here in your life where you would really take inventory, where you would really become aware and say, Lord, if I've prayed faithless prayers, forgive me because I serve a faithful God. Lord, you've shown me what I need to see You've shown me the direction I need to go in. I hear your voice calling me from over there. And even if I have to run into a few people to get there, I know which way I'm going. Your sheep know your voice. And I'm running hard after you. And so by the time he gets there and says, would you regain my sight? He says, go ahead. Your faith made you whole. Your faith your faith in what? Your faith that I didn't just want to help you out in your brokenness. I wanted to heal you from it. I wanted to heal you from it. The church has tragically followed the world on the mission of medicating pain. 
And here's how we do it. We distract you from it for maybe an hour. Some churches, it's like, we've got it down to like 37 minutes on a Sunday morning. We're not one of those churches if you haven't figured that out yet. We distract you with lights and music and emotion and goosebumps and prayer and motivational messages. But tragically, you can leave here just like you came, just as broken, just as crippled and just as much bondage. Nobody's twisting your arm saying, get free. Although we've tried that. At the end of the day, you have to answer the question of the Lord. What do you really want him to do? If it's more change in your cup, the Lord might oblige, keep you coming back until you're really ready to receive transformation, until you're really ready to be healed. I know for me, I lived a lot of my life scared to death that I was going to miss the will of God. I spent my years at Zion, formerly Zion, now North Point. I spent my years, I showed the first service. There was stage was just like this. There's an organ right here, a big black C3, and I played it. I was the house organ player, so I should have had my stuff together, and I didn't. And, uh, and there was a spot right behind the organ and every morning I'd break into the chapel and from six to eight, I would kneel right here and I would weep and pray and weep and pray and weep and pray and beg the Lord to not let me miss his will. Now you may think that sounds crazy, but if you've ever been to Zion and Barrington, you'd think, man, these people miss the will of God. <laughs> if you measured it by the world's metrics. And I, and I would cut beg God, Lord, I just don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss it. I want to make sure, God, I want to marry the right person. And I want to, I want to have the right job and I want to be in the right ministry. And I don't want to, I don't want to mess this up. I don't want the sin in my life to mess this up. Petrified, terrified that I was going to miss it. But you know what the Lord set me free of? He set me free of the fear and the faithlessness, the doubt that causes me to backpedal away. Sometimes we just pray when we're too afraid to really ask what we know we should ask for. We say, let your will be done. Anybody pray that prayer? Let your will be done. Just your will, whatever that will is. Okay, there are times the Holy Spirit will lead you to pray that prayer because you don't know. And then there are times that you pray that prayer as a cop-out, as the cheap way out of having to pray the real faith-filled prayers that as believers we're called to pray. I remember I was sitting around a, a finance meeting table a couple months ago and Judd had come. It was like your first finance meeting with us and you sat down and we went around the table. Everybody's praying and it gets to Judd and he starts praying this prayer and like it was breaking stuff in the spirit. I don't even know if you remember this. You start praying stuff and dude, I just lost it because even in a finance meeting, where we should have more faith than ever, sometimes we backpedal to the safe place. We backpedal to the crust of bread and a few more coins in a cup. And it took me hearing a faith-filled prayer back in the late summer, early fall to like bring me light years ahead in what I was believing God for again. And I say again, because you know, the Lord's shown you enough to know how to pray over your life. The Lord's given you a glimpse He's given you a dream. He's given you a vision. And just somewhere along the way, you settled for blindness instead. Well, let your will be done. If it's your will that I regain sight. Bartimaeus didn't pray that. Jesus didn't ask him, what do you think my will is? He says, what do you want? You cried out to me. What do you really want? And before we leave this morning, I wonder if there's anybody in this room and you'd say, I want my vision back. I want my vision back. 
Is there anybody in this room and you'd say, there was a time when I was walking and I could see. There was a time when I was living to fulfill the call of God, the anointing that was on my life. And my family and my fruit and my future all reflected that call. But somewhere along the way, maybe the, the crowd got involved. Maybe the voice came in. Maybe the whisper. Maybe something tried to reconnect you to your past while you were trying to connect yourself to who Jesus is. Well, I want you to know he's in the room this morning. And if it's your prayer to regain vision, would you step out of your seat? Would you meet me down at this altar here? Because I believe he's going to restore sight. A lot of times in the church we talk about vision and we talk about it like, uh, like this, like, uh, like, oh, our church's vision, like it's this thing that you can write in a one line and have printed on a banner and hang it somewhere to woo people in. Oh, my vision for this ministry, my vision for New England, my vision, my vision. You know what vision really is? Even when, even when scripture says, and we quote it all the time, without, we usually say without a vision, the people perish. It's not. There's no definite article there in the Hebrew. It's without vision, the people perish. In other words, without sight, without just the ability to see. See, the worst thing about a vision is that you see it once and then you go blind. And then you spend the rest of your life trying to feel around, grasping at straws in the hopes that, that, you know, something productive will come of it and you'll live to tell of it another day. And that's never been what the Lord wants. That's never been what he settled for. And it sure as heck wasn't what he died for. No. He wants us to be able to see to be able to see in the spirit, to be able to see, to catch a glimpse of heaven for our marriages, to catch a glimpse of heaven for our kids and how we're raising them, to catch a glimpse for what it looks like to be a believer in, in the season of life that you're in right now, a real faith-filled, spirit-filled believer in the season of life that you're in right now. And some of y'all are like, I'm just waiting until this season's over. And the Lord's like, I'm just waiting for you to tell me what you want. This season isn't over until your brokenness gets healed. I'm done putting change in your cup. We're done with the crust of bread. We're going after vision. We're going after vision. Take three steps forward. Everybody down here, three steps. One, two, three. It almost felt like a line dance there for a second. Anyway, John, we'll do that later. He knew who he believed in, but he needed to know what to believe for. Some of you, you've got to wade past a couple decades of faithless prayers. Some of you, you have to wade past bad teaching from well-intentioned pastors who, when they couldn't help you find breakthrough, just helped you kind of break in the chair you were in, the seat by the side of the road at the gate. Yeah, keep coming down. Keep coming down. Just come close. If you're here, if you're on our altar team or our, our intercessory team, if you're on pastoral staff or an elder, I'm going to invite you here in just a minute to come and begin to move behind this group. If you are not on our prayer team, do not come down here and pray for people or we'll tell you to stop. At the end of the day, this is about you going back to maybe being seven years old. There's somebody and the Lord showed you something as a kid as a child and for a while you believed for it for a while you prayed for it and then enough stuff happened that clouded your ability to see it anymore and so you sat back and you started praying prayers like well whatever your will is if it be your will there's nothing wrong with that prayer unless the Lord showed you better so Father right now 
I pray, God, that we would move past the faithlessness and fruitlessness of that kind of prayers and that we would get a hold of the vision that you've always intended us to see, that we would lock eyes once again with Jesus, son of David. And that, Lord, regardless of how well we're mobilized right now or, or how foolish it's going to look to be running in the state that we're in and what people are going to think who have already decided what our lot is in life, Lord, we throw our cloak to the side and we come after you. We know your voice and we hear you and we come after you, Lord. And to answer that question across the board as your bride, Lord, would you touch our blindness? Would you speak to what handicaps us, to what paralyzes us? Would you speak to that tourniquet that holds back the anointing from really being operated in in our lives? God, forgive us when we've applied the stigma to the wrong thing, when we've wrestled against flesh and blood and we've made somebody the enemy. Lord, if there's those of us down here today and, and, and we, we, we can't stop thinking about the offender, we can't stop thinking about the person whose fault it is that we're in the state we're in. God, I pray that our heart change would begin right there. With, with, with an act of decided forgiveness that we choose to let that go so that we can get our eyes where they belong, so that we can see through the haze of bitterness and grudge and we can catch heaven again. I see some of you down here and you're like that fighter jet with the, with the, the radar thing trying to lock in on what it is that you're supposed to be going after and the enemies had you on a wild goose chase but I, I see the skies opening up and that target that line of sight it's honing in but when you lock it on it's up to you to pull the trigger it's up to you to fire it's up to you to begin to pray those faith filled prayers yes I believe it here's what, here's what I need and Lord, I'm not afraid to ask you. I'm not afraid to tell you because you're not the kind of God that judges me when I get it wrong. You're the kind of God that doesn't stop until we get it right. Lord, help our, help our unbelief. We love you. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I'm just going to invite that prayer team to move through this crowd. If you're down here, stay here. If you're somewhere else in the, uh, in the room and you need to sneak out, God bless you. Go in peace. But if you need to be down here, please come down. Please come down. Don't rush out. Let's do some business with the Lord this morning. I come out of agreement with the lie that you have left me on my own I am not alone I come out of agreement With the worry and the fear I've come to know No, they won't have a hold on me Protector You never, never, never The truth that you are who you say you are, that I can trust your heart, and I come into agreement with what heaven has declared over my life, because I know. Say 
Shout out. 